Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. I know the nine o'clock start time is a little difficult, <laughs> and then we appreciate everyone being here and uh, getting through security and, and, and coming to our session. So I'm Karen McCabe. I'm with IEEE, and today we have uh, a great panel uh, to talk about internet inclusions shaping the digital future. We know that there's so many great opportunities and work uh, underway and how we can accelerate, accelerate progress to um, connect those who are unconnected and underserved. But today we also want to have a discussion not just about the challenges. We really want to have a, a roll up the sleeves uh, and a discussion, push the envelope a little bit about, you know, from your experiences and our panel experience what you'll hear today of, um, you know, what's working, what may not be working. They're all working in amazing spaces, doing amazing things and have a lot to share to help see how we can, you know, progress uh, advancing solutions for the unconnected. So with that, I would like to introduce our moderator, Deepak Masharari, who's also the IEEE Internet Initiative Vice Chair of the IEEE. With us, we have Jane Coffin from ISOC, Adrian Lovett from the Web Foundation, Samar Baba from IEEE Site, and Christopher Yu from the University of Pennsylvania. So with that, I'll hand it over. Oops, I'm sorry. I, had a, I wanted to do a little bit of a warm-up to get everyone um, uh, kind of an icebreaker to get us thinking in, in a positive way. So, Fast forward, and we want to do a little bit of a rapid fire and just, you know, kind of shout out what you, what you think. But one word that describes internet access 10 years from now. For everybody. Everybody. Just Universal. Universal. I think it's invisible. Participation. <laughs> can we can go around the room because there's not that many of us. So let's hear from the panelists, one word. Well, can I have two? <laughs> because I think there's two, there's two routes here. So I would say essential as one, but perhaps provocatively I would say broken, if I can put a question mark after it. Dynamic. Okay. Well, with that, I'll hand it over to Deepak to get into the dialogue. Thanks, Karen, and good morning, everybody. I know it's uh, uh, the view from the window outside per is perhaps better, but still, <laughs> thanks to all of you for uh, being here. Uh, when we are looking at internet inclusion, uh, it can have multiple dimensions and multiple ways of looking at things. So for example, somebody in a developed country may look at internet inclusion, whether everybody has access or not, in terms of uh, having a, on a smartphone or maybe even having a home PC, whereas uh, a village in India or in Africa, people may still be thinking about having some sort of kiosk, uh, maybe running two hours or four hours a day on some level of electricity with some poor level of connectivity, and uh, is it still available or not available? So the dimensions can vary a lot uh, between uh, different locations and different uh, perspectives. But then uh, we just had an event uh, about two and a half months back in India, in Delhi, uh, on the similar theme, Internet Inclusion and Advancing Solutions. And through the workshop there that day, uh, the participants came up with a five-way framework. And I just want to touch upon those words a little bit. One was about awareness. Are people aware about the Internet? What it can do what it cannot do, things like that. Availability, so which is basically about uh, having uh, availability of the services and devices. Affordability of services and devices, I mean, what price points those things are available. So maybe a $1,000 phone doesn't seem too much for some people. At the same time, for some people, even paying a $1 a month for a service may be just too much. And then accessibility, and when we are looking at accessibility, it's not just about physical or uh, uh, 
uh, those aspects of accessibility. It's also about accessibility in terms of language and gender and other aspects of that. And also assurance, which is about uh, how do people have trust in the system, in the ecosystem, in terms of security, privacy, safety, protection, everything, and uh, resilience. So with that, uh, let's start with the discussion today. Uh, Karen has already introduced all the panelists. My request would be for each of them to make about two minutes on each of these topics. So we'll go like uh, uh, these uh, things in uh, phases. So initially, we'll do availability and awareness, these two things. So I would request you to speak for about two minutes each. And then, of course, uh, we'll have comments and questions from uh, all the those who are <coughs> present here. So you can start with the Chris. You. So in terms of availability, uh, the project that I'm working on, One World Connected at the University of Pennsylvania, is very much dedicated to this idea. What we did cataloged is 750 innovative ways people are attempting to connect people to the internet. What we discovered is there's a complete lack of empirical information about what's working and what isn't. And we find that ministers who are faced with the obligation of connecting their people are being bombarded with uh, different people offering different solutions and they don't really have any traction on the be able to do, to find out what actually works. Second, there's only half the seven billion world citizens online. What we're discovering is a lot of the uh, models that are being supported right now are being done on grant or corporate social responsibility money and they do not have scalable models. They actually have no revenue whatsoever, and when the grant money runs out, they have no ability to continue to operate. And so what's created is a new emphasis in terms of creating accessibility. It's not just getting people connected, it's keeping them connected. And that becomes a very different problem. What we're discovering is that, in fact, um, to get to three and a half billion, there's gonna be, it's not one solution, it's gonna be different solutions for urban, rural, mountainous, island, different types of areas and that we need to find, where possible, the ability to, ha to harness private company investment because public investment's not gonna get us all the way there and charitable investment isn't gonna get us all the way there. To try to find that right balance where it's available and to try to find ways that scale and sustain. Last thought. Um, many, uh, the, uh, the questions you gave us in advance said beyond accessibility and availability, is it enough to deploy? There's an old line from a movie, they say, if you build it, they will come. Uh, we've discovered that's simply not true that if you measure the barriers to adoption, it includes things that's, such as digital literacy, and shockingly to the people who are here at the Internet Governance Forum is relevance. Do, why do they need it? And you discover this is robust across developing and developed societies, India, China, Brazil, all the surveys have found the same thing. And so even if you build cheap, ubiquitous networks, if you don't attend to giving people the digital literacy training and showing them the relevance of it, you still won't, we still won't accomplish the goals that all of us here are committed to. And that's why we're trying to do validation on the demand side as well as the supply side to lay the empirical base that the finance community needs to decide how to make investments, that governments need how to make, learn how to make investments, and to actually make this on a scale, to achieve the goal that we've all set for connecting one and a half billion more people by the year 2020. Thanks, yes. Adrian. Well, thanks, Deepak. I, I think if the question is around what does internet access really mean, I mean, first, I agree completely with Chris. If you build it, they won't necessarily come, or they may come and then go, or they may come and not really get into the game. Um, so I absolutely agree. That's a central uh, insight to, to help frame this discussion. I do think maybe at this point it's worth uh, taking a step back, even in this, this room of, uh, of, of uh, extremely well-versed um, colleagues, um, because internet access actually, of course, does mean so much, and it's, it, it's worth, I think, banking that as we go into this discussion. Otherwise, why do we care about ensuring that everyone has that access? You know, and the fact that today, uh, you know, we're at this kind of in the next year, this 50-50 moment where we will finally pass that mark of half the world having access to the web, access to the internet um, for the first time, you know, gives us a, a moment for pause and to recognize the extraordinary um, uh, benefits that have ar arisen from that, whether economic, whether people being able to uh, create businesses, to, to, to earn a living, build a livelihood, uh, whether more social benefits, uh, political opportunities for people to engage and connect and, uh, and, and organize together, which is so crucial to our to our democracies around the world, um, the, the chance for people to meet the love of their life. You know, everything has been possible, many things have been possible um, through internet access for those who have had it. Um, 
And even you know, a week ago, I was in, uh, in a village called Girisuko in Indonesia, uh, about an hour and a half out from Yogyakarta, um, where, as, as people will know, there's been a cyclone that has gone through that part of the world in the last couple of weeks. And uh, the place that people in the village who I was talking to were going to, to find out information about how the bridge a few kilometers away had been damaged and how long it was going to take to be fixed, and that was a key route to market and school and so on. The place they were going was to the village information portal, which is a website. Um, and they were also, of course, in touch with their friends on, on WhatsApp and Facebook as well and finding out what was happening in, in other parts of the district. Um, and actually, at the same time as I was there, I noticed that uh, Google issued its top 10 search terms of, uh, of 2017. And of course, there was stuff in there like the fidget spinner and so on, which is all great. But actually, the number one uh, search term globally last this year was Hurricane Irma. And while people were not searching Hurricane Irma for fun. Mm -hmm. um, they were <laughs> unlikely anyway. Um, they were doing it for all sorts of very important reasons. So internet access, absolutely central. And I guess that's why it's great that we're talking about, uh, the, in, in our view at the Web Foundation, the absolute imperative that we push on from that 50-50 mark and get not just the next billion, but that we design our approaches from here on to ensure that the web and the internet really are for everyone as they were intended to be. Thanks. Okay. Samar? And, uh, the side project that we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the availability of internet, for example, because uh, you can find countries suffering from addiction from internet, like Japan, the US, etc., and countries like mine, Tunisia, suffering from um, a lack of accessibility of internet, even into schools. And uh, the, uh, that comes um, our project uh, Tawassal with the IEEE site. Uh, we are trying to provide internet access to schools in rural areas. For example, in my country, only 40% of the schools and university, universities uh, have internet access. So it's really important to talk about availability because it can really be a mean of uh, creating opportunity of jobs and connecting, and it's really essential now. Um, about the awareness, yes, we can talk here about security and and, um, and training, for example, kids and uh, users about um, the uh, inconvenience of getting a deck from using internet and the cybersecurity, for example, etc. So, so yes, I I think that internet access is essential, and everyone has to have internet access nowadays. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, so, Jean, uh, ISOC has been doing uh, uh, this thing and uh, recently, of course, the anniversary. So, congratulations for that. That's eligibly. And uh, so, uh, what's been the ISOC experience in this space? Thank you very much. Um, I work for the Internet Society. If you don't know that organization, as Deepak said, we're 25 years old today. Our mission is an affordable, available, open, accessible Internet. And it should be for everyone. And um, I think Mei Lin is going to appreciate the next word I'm going to say is that it's about people. Um, we've had chapters around the world who work from the bottom up, who are on the ground. So I call this the local, local issues. You can't come in to a local um, village. Adrian was just in a village in Indonesia. You can't go in and say, we really know what's good for you. There are so many old aid projects that have come in around the world where people thought they knew what people needed. Unless you ask people what they need and work with them from the local level, you'll never make a sustainable infrastructure stay. You won't get that scale that you need because there, there's no one invested at that personal level. I'm going to say four things very briefly about that question you had with respect to availability and awareness. One, if we want more available architecture, infrastructure, technical infrastructure, we have to change the way we do policy and regulatory inclusion and change those policies. The old communications policies from a telecom perspective will not help scale what we need from the internet inclusion perspective, infrastructure itself. And I've been a regulator, so I know this, <laughs> and I've been in a ministry. People have to be allowed to be involved in that process. Um, sometimes it's just regulators and policymakers talking to each other. That doesn't help if you don't know what's needed at the local level. Um, funding vehicles, the massive funding vehicles that come the $2 billion, $10 million range, 
Well, those are laudable for many big infrastructure projects. That doesn't work at the local level. We've helped build internet exchange points and community networks for as little as $10,000. So we need to figure out, as Christopher's saying though, how to move from the volunteer funded model to the business model at that level. So it's also an awareness on the ground of what the local customs are from an indigenous perspective for those communities that are highly marginalized. It's a very different ecosystem and you have to work with the village elders and the kids to make that stick. And you can't assume you know how that's going to work because it's more of a collective mentality. And transparency. If there's no transparency in regulatory, financing, how things work on the ground, you will be given certain answers that actually aren't those uh, answers that will help you make the projects work or allow for that sustainability. And from a regulatory perspective, if you don't know where to go to get a license, how much spectrum there is, you can't start your project. You can't get very far. Uh, or you could also have a situation where, for example, things like Wi-Fi you can't even use. Exactly. I mean, forget about license fee, etc. So now at this point of time, I would just like to invite comments or questions, uh, but please be brief in the interest of time. And uh, yeah, anybody? Yeah, please. And could you also introduce yourself briefly? Yes, my name is uh, Julius Endert. I'm from the Deutsche Welle uh, Academy, German broadcaster, and we also do media development projects. Um, so my question is, you, we are uh, talking about digital inclusion and digital participation, but why, what, I'm, what I have not heard is uh, a definition what, da, what inclusion or participation really means. Uh, does somebody of you have uh, uh, a definition? Because we are also working on a project on digital participation and we try to find ways to measure it on the ground and which factors are um, uh, to be researched. And, but we are struggling to, to find a, a correct or, or feasible definition okay. for participation. Anybody else? Yeah, Greg. Maybe we can try the other mic. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Christopher, two questions. One is, um, where have you seen, uh, you know, what's been successful at uh, improving the literacy? I mean, how do you know when a community is ready uh, and and finally sees a need, or is it uh, something you just have to synchronously teach as part of giving access? I mean, what, in terms of projects that you've seen that have been successful. So um, the, the results are preliminary. We're just gathering them, but I'll give you, I'm not gonna weasel out, I'll give you the preliminary answer. Um, the more um, outcome functional oriented the training is, the better. So what do I mean? Don't teach people how to use operating systems and Microsoft Word mm -hmm. in the abstract. Help them write a resume. Help them put up a website for their business. Help them uh, apply for education online. And, the, and also uh, domestic, local trainers, local language content contextualized for their perspective. But the more on the ground, I mean, we want to have these general skill packages. We're discovering that that immediate impact, benef benef making the immediate ben benefits clearer and making it locally tailored or essential to this, or the hallmarks of successful digital literacy programs. Uh, on the issue of uh, digital participation that you mentioned, uh, I would say that's definitely one of the major challenges that we have. Like uh, on Sunday, we had a day zero event, and one of the discussion points that we had was that how do you define these things? Uh, let's say the number of, uh, you could say number of uh, connections per 100 people, you could say number of customers per 100 people, you could say number of users, which, and you could also say number of beneficiaries. Now, each of these may differ significantly. So some of this work, I would say in terms of digital participation, uh, I don't think there's any universally agreed upon definitional framework at this point of time, but uh, different people and different organizations are working on this area, including research like uh, Chris and uh, World Wide Web Foundation and others. Melan, you want to? Something. Well, I think we've got somebody on the panel who's working on the ground, that's Samar Baba. And I would like to see if Samar has a response to Deutsche Welle's question. 
of because, the self-participation? You know, the, the, the question was, what, what is the definition of digital participation in such a way that it could be useful for the funders? So I look at the panel and I see people who are kind of policy and doing it at the broad level, but Sama is the one person who is actually doing it on the ground. And so just from your experience in Tunisia, what makes a difference for people? Why would they want to get onto the internet? Uh, thank you for your question, Maiden. Um, from my experience, um, using internet is really important for people that um, that that don't have resources to to de to develop themselves. For example, by my uh, by my experience uh, working with the Tawassal within IEEE site, we are organizing, for example, workshops for the kids for, from different ages uh, and to show them how to code using Scratch, for example, uh, how to improve their uh, technical skills. Uh, Internet uh, in Tunisia is almost about using Facebook and YouTube and doing some research through Google. So, um, yes, um, it, uh, it imp we, we, we are really empowering um, people in Tunisia and we are trying to connect all the regions. So we are seeing the real impact of digital participation um, through our workshops and through our, our work. So, yes. And how are you measuring these uh, things? Uh, is there any framework that you have for measurement of these? Uh... Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we are working with a consultant um, that, uh, that works with 100 um, million healthier, 100 healthier lives. And we are trying to, to work on the measures. For example, we will know that we are, uh, we are doing the right thing and we are uh, approaching uh, the project in the uh, right terms by um, having, for example, uh, 24 leaders uh, that will that can answer all the questions about what we provided uh, from our workshops. Um, and yes. So, the, so these are these people are easily available for anybody who needs help in terms of accessing, uh, using a device, things like that. Yes. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah, Chris. So I don't mean to speak out of turn in the sense that Malin is absolutely right. Um, we are proud to have Tawassal as one of our case studies. They're doing fantastic work on the ground, and I cannot replace the authentic voice with which they speak. I also have to thank Jane, because ISOC has funded projects around the world, and they've been very generous about giving us access to their project leaders. So we're not the actual project executors, but we have talked directly with 120 of them. And what I would say is, um, we, at the internet governance community, have a certain nearsightedness. Uh, we fall in love with the internet, and the benefits of it are obvious to us. What's funny is if you talk about broader policymaking communities in terms of deliverables of what digital inclusion is, um, I think we need to get outside that. The communication minister is behind connectivity for its own sake. But if you're going to build broader coalitions in governments, you have to talk about digital inclusion in terms of development goals such as economic empowerment, financial inclusion, improved healthcare outcomes, improved education. And in the end, we don't get internet connections for their own sake. We get them because of the other things they do for us. So one thing I would like to encourage the internet community to start to think about is to define digital inclusion not just in terms of getting people connected to the network, but in terms of what it'll do for them, because particularly you meet countries where their needs are, and they vary widely. And so by framing it this way, it'll create a slightly different answer in different places, but I think it's much more effective at achieving the goals we have, sh the shared goals of global connectivity and participation. Yeah. So for example, in a country like India, we have this uh, program called JAM, which is the Janthan Aadhaar Mobile Project. Uh, so Janthan stands for a financial inclusion program where people could have a zero balance account. They are linked to mobile, and they are also linked to a digital identity called Aadhaar, which is based on biometrics. So this is a online authenticable uh, identity and having a trinity of these that's how it is working much better rather than if it would have been on a standalone basis so at this point of time i would just like to move on to the next segment of our discussion yeah you you want to have some quick point yeah, please yes thank you sebastian I, just a, I would a thought 
do we really need to decide why they will use and uh, for what they will use internet? Uh, the next billion user may use it for some other purposes that what uh, we are thinking about. We need to give them internet connection, full stop. The rest is how we can discuss with them, try to tell them that they could use it for this or that, but at the end of the day, uh, fortunately, uh, if it's an open internet, it will be used for maybe totally other purposes than what it's used today and what it's our thinking. Leave yeah. free uh, freedom of the next billion users to use it as they want. Thank you. I, I think that's absolutely right that people will figure out some ways to do different things. But as Chris also mentioned, that when we are developing these type of projects on the ground, it is useful to engage with the local community. What are their uh, needs, uh, which may not be directly related to the internet per se, but how is it that we can actually facilitate that and encourage them on that particular uh, aspect. Uh, Chris, we just need to move to the next segment now. Okay, so quick, the, the barrier is people don't believe it's relevant. So you have to show them one use case relevant. to see its relevance. And meeting them where they are is proven to be an essential thing for deploying. The other thing we're finding on the cost side, 55% of the country sell application-specific plans on feature phones on 2G spectrum. Yeah. I mean, it's very limited, and being everything to everybody is going to, it's easier to bridge into full deployment sometimes by allowing them to focus on things which are pro most popular in the current environment. Okay, thanks. So now let's move to affordability and accessibility. Now, affordability, obviously, it's much easier to grasp, but affordability, again, uh, people need to look at what's the cost of device, what's the cost of uh, service, and the service is not just in terms of the service that you pay, let's say, in terms of data plan or something like that, but also service as the cost of applications or using a particular service. So, for example, there are places where if you are making an on, I mean, um, in India, if you are making an online train booking, you have to pay extra. Uh, whereas uh, the fact is, yes, definitely to railways it must be costing less to do it online if people are going online rather than standing in a, little, in a physical line and uh, being served at a counter. But that's how the structures are. So what are those type of incentives and other things uh, that can be made? And when people are talking of accessibility, one of the challenges that have is one around languages. For I come from a country where we have 22 official languages recognized by our constitution, apart from English. Uh, and uh, just for a comparison, in EU, you have got 24 languages. So Europa.eu, that's the home page of EU. You see nothing but 24 language blocks to choose from. And all of them are left to right. Uh, whereas in uh, our situation, we have left to right, right to left, uh, one language, multiple scripts, multiple languages, same script, so multiple complexity around that. And obviously for some of these languages and scripts, the population size that is using uh, or practicing that particular language is much smaller. So what are the incentives, what are the ways to facilitate that? Then people are looking at affordable accessibility, for example, uh, for people with di differently abled people. So people having motor challenges, people having hearing or visual or speech challenges. And if you have a website that times out, let's say within three seconds of not taking a particular action, what happens if for a person with a motor disability? Uh, because that person may take a little bit longer to do that. What happens if you are creating a CAPTCHA, which is too difficult for a normal person, leave aside somebody with a visual impairment? And how do we make those things simpler? So on one hand, yes, we need to still ensure assurance of that, yes, you're doing a second factor authentication, but also at the same time make things simpler. And oftentimes people have this uh, thinking that if I am trying to make something more accessible, it will become more costly. But people should also think about something else. Something like a Kindle or other type of ebook readers, they originally started with people with visual challenges because the braille books were too heavy and people started looking at that, and that's something which actually helped everybody. So if we have a un philosophy of universal design, uh, that's something which could help a lot. So I just want to start with Adrian on this. Uh, I mean, World Wide Web uh, Consortium has done a lot of things on WCAG 2.0, for example, on accessibility standards and other things. But how do you also see this whole ish angle about affordability and accessibility. I mean, this, there's always this challenge and people find this tenuous relationship between these two concepts. 
Yeah, I mean, I, first, I agree with everything you said, Deepak. I think you outlined it very clearly, the, the set of, of challenges there. I mean, we start with the affordability question, and, uh, and many of us uh, in this room and in this discussion uh, are working together as part of the Alliance for Affordable Internet, um, which seeks to drive down the, the costs of, of broadband working, bringing together the big tech firms and uh, governments and civil society. Um, and you know, there's been some progress on that in, in the last year or so with this notion that we've, we've all put together of uh, one for two, that uh, one gigabyte of, of, uh, of data should cost no more than 2% of average monthly income. And through the Alliance for Affordable Internet, you know, we've got now a good picture, including just some updated figures a couple of weeks ago that show how we're doing against that target. Um, and you know, some countries are, have come now below that level now that uh, uh, that, that affordability measure, uh, but many, and in particular African countries, um, are still well above that. Um, so for us, that's the, the first and most obvious barrier uh, to, to, to access is, is affordability um, after the, the even more obvious kind of technical ability to connect, you know, actually having, having coverage. Um, but then I think you know, access goes beyond that uh, and exactly in the ways that you, you've outlined, Deepak, and, and this also relates, I think, to the first discussion, doesn't it, about uh, demand because um, you know, if you build it but it doesn't uh, work for everyone, then of course they won't come because why would they? Um, and here I think that the sorts of things that are being explored um, in, in, in many areas, including how community networks are being particularly used, in this respect, to try to really take account of, uh, of particular barriers in particular communities and for particular parts of those communities and how those community networks and public networks can be, uh, if you like, given uh, special opportunities, whether it's access to, to unlicensed spectrum or uh, other ways in which uh, we can build sustainability around those models of, uh, of access. Uh, I think that's part of the picture that we're, that we're uh, building here. Okay. So, Gene, uh, when ISOC is looking at these issues, like, say, community networks, uh, you also have people like uh, Mahavir Poon, for example, who was awarded on uh, uh, setting up a, a remote uh, Wi-Fi networks in the hilly terrain in Nepal. And you also have been propagating this whole idea about low-cost, affordable internet exchange points. And I, being a co-founder of National Internet Exchange of India, so I understand the uh, challenges uh, in terms of having a neutral, but still uh, something which works uh, well in that space. So what's been the experience there in terms of how do you, so one of, obviously, IXP, et cetera, can reduce the cost to some extent, uh, but uh, only so much. Uh, but beyond that, there are other challenges, and there are also challenges on the device side. So how do you handle that? Sure. The device side is one of my favorite topics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and for the record, I also help build communities, but I also help build the infrastructure. So I'm not just policy anymore. Mm. I've changed hats. Um, the good news is um, we often have free equipment that we help donate. If you start to think about community networks and internet exchange points as very small joint venture JV projects from a very simple internet perspective, it's a startup. It's very simple. But it's a community-based startup, so you have to start with the people, training people, building capacity, building a community, and a neutral technical community. If you don't have that neutrality at the internet exchange point, you'll have nothing. It won't be sustainable, and people won't uh, interconnect with you. But back to the equipment side, customs, taxes. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> we've sent equipment to a country and it sits, and unfortunately, I'm not gonna use any examples of a specific country, but if I have free equipment and I'm sending you two very important pieces of equipment to help you run your local internet, and it sits in customs for three months, <laughs> and there's a 50% duty on free equipment, you kept your internet in jail. If you're a regulator or policymaker, those customs policies have to change. In the Caribbean, we've had the easiest time. The regulators and policymakers help us, the equipment comes in, they get it out of jail, and it goes exactly where it needs to go. But if you have equipment coming into your country and you cannot deploy it, that's ridiculous. And it's Hamal, um, I won't use, the standards that are used and accepted around the world and the different marks of acceptance, those should be recognized. The US, Europe, Japan, Canada, Brazil, we've all gone through these massive what are called homologation processes, where the standards are there, as well as UL, for the electrical side. So it's not as if we're sending equipment that's gonna blow up the minute you, you 
input it into the uh, system, but you've got to not try and say you're going to retest the equipment. That takes months of time. And if you're a, someone trying to deploy a low-cost network and you can't get that equipment out, it's a non-starter. Um, one other thing from the Internet Exchange Point side and or the community network side, you have to stop thinking that this is a massive infrastructure project when you start. It goes through phases. There's the startup phase, a more sophisticated phase, and then an even more sophisticated phase. We've worked through all those phases, from the community building to the neutrality perspective, and helping people get more funding in and cost base. There's a network in Oaxaca, Mexico, where people are paying 2 to $3 a month. Peter Bloom, who's here, has helped start that network you're not looking at massive amounts of money for a very simple service. This is voice over IP, 2G network, where they were able to deploy a network because they talked to the government and got the licenses. So it's important if you're going to scale, you've got to have that sustainability and stability of the licensing there with you so that you're not illegal. We're not talking pirate networks because if they are pirate, the big incumbents will try and shut them down because they see them as a threat. So the key thing is to think about who you have to talk to and what network. IEEE has a massive network of people. We have a massive network of humans around the world who've done this. So I think the key thing is that connecting the dots across the different projects and regions to see what hasn't worked and what has worked. Because the what hasn't worked is just as important as the what has worked. Sure. Yeah. So some are, uh, when you're looking at accessibility and affordability, so one obviously is challenges uh, like in any other developing country, you would have those challenges. But also looking at from cultural aspects of what type of uh, uh, challenges have you seen in terms of accessibility, especially for example for girls and women in these type of uh, projects? Yes, in fact, uh, yeah. Uh, talking about gender uh, in terms of accessi accessibility, I can tell that some study made in different countries like Tunisia, for example, shows that boys have more opportunities to access the internet than girls. I want to talk, for example, about my country. Uh, men have access to public places more than women, in coffee shops, in schools, at work. Meanwhile, women are raising kids and having some more other responsibilities. So uh, through my, um, my uh, uh, work with the Tawassal project, for example, in, in some regions in Tunisia, because we work especially in the rural areas, uh, we are trying to empower kids and, and teach them how, how, how to use internet, and we are giving them opportunity that the government and the schools are not given, given it to them. And uh, you'll find more, more boys than girls attending the school. So, so yes, we, we have to think about the gender, um, um, the gender equality okay. <laughs> yeah, in terms of uh, accessibility of internet. But when it happens in terms of gender e equality, you are saying, uh, are you also seeing examples where uh, um, using internet itself, it has empowered the women? Uh, women? Yeah, I mean, once they get access to the internet, so getting access to the internet itself was a challenge for them. Yes. The first phase. But once you facilitated that, what is the impact after that? Yes, for example, uh, in Tunisia, um, we are very interested by entrepreneurship and creating your own uh, startup. So, for example, by giving internet access to women, uh, they, uh, you can find a lot of women that are doing um, homemade work and, uh, for example, selling uh, homemade products. So by giving them internet access, uh, access they can create their own website and, and have larger uh, clients and can get more money than she used to get. Yes, it's very okay. helpful. So Chris, uh, okay, before Chris, uh, Adrian wants to have something and after that, I'll I just quickly wanted to to, um, to endorse uh, and support what Samar said, and, and to 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 add that I think that from our point of view at the Web Foundation, this this the, the gender framing of this is absolutely critical. We have a project called Women's Rights Online. One of the things that that project has found in our research in the last year or so uh, is that in the places where we looked, which were mainly uh, urban developing country contexts, women were up to 50% less likely to be online than men, um, and in a way more important than that top line uh, number, which is probably no surprise to most of us, 
less likely, women less likely to be doing certain things, such as applying for a job online or expressing a strong opinion online. Um, now, why is there that difference? And as we try to understand the, uh, the, the, the reasons, uh, at least the expressed uh, reasons uh, talking to, to, uh, to women in that survey, um, the first reason that they cite is cost, and the second is skills and a perceived lack of skills. I say perceived because uh, men in the same communities um, arguably were not more skilled and yet didn't perceive that as so much of an obstacle, which may be something about more psychology than anything else. Um, but, uh, you know, so we've, we've got work going on on cost uh, together with things like the affordable access at work. Um, the skills part as well, equally important that we're, we're focused on that. Thanks. Uh, so, Chris, uh, what's been your uh, evaluation at this point of time? I know it's still a work in progress, but uh, especially on aspects of affordability and uh, accessibility in different communities around the world. So, I think, thank you. I think that um, the examples that, that um, Jane gave is about Rhizomaticus, an excellent example. It is, uh, they're making a go of it on less than $3 US. Uh, to me, India, your country is a good example. The typical data plan is $6 US or less. It's a country with 1.3 billion phone users and only 300 million internet users. So we have a billion people who have phones who are not currently internet users. And it's an enormous opportunity, but it highlights the challenge. We're, we're talking about legacy phones. We're talking about feature phones, 2G technologies, web-based apps, not separate apps on operating systems. It's a very different world. And so understanding how we have to adapt policies to make sense for that is in a lot of sense. And one of the key me mechanisms I mentioned before is application-centric plans, where you buy an email plan or something yeah. that doesn't give you access to the whole internet, but gives you access you, to what you, you really need. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting to me is, um, the, Jay mentioned donated equipment, and we've talked about capacity building. An important part of it is recruiting uh, volunteers what, and sometimes some projects are called barefoot engineers. These are people yeah. who are going to maintain, they, you actually train the trainers who will get the people who are going to maintain the network. There are some great projects we've seen which go up beautifully, but six to 12 months later they're off. And forget just maintaining them, upgrades, new equipment, things that get out of support, it's just a constant problem. Um, uh, two other thoughts I'd leave you with, I want to just point out, um, for, if you want to see someone else who's actually built networks, Ezekiel Tari from Vanuatu and the Maywo Telecommunications Committee, we've invited nine or uh, actually 11 project groups to speak at our events. And if you're interested, Thursday at 1040, we're actually going to have them tell their stories. And I think it's wonderful we have Tawasal here. That's an important part, which I think is often missing. The last thing I will say is I have to apologize. I have to leave for another session. But my colleague, Mugi Haseke, who will join us in, uh, and continue to speak for One World Connected. But thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, in fact, uh, when Chris was talking about the Barefoot Engineers, so there, in India there's a college called Barefoot College, and there's only one requirement for, uh, there's one particular eligibility for admission into that, and that's you should have never gone to a formal education. That's the only qualification for admission into that college. So, okay, so maybe you can come over and switch the seats here. Uh, now. Can we have any other questions or comments on these issues or affordability and accessibility? And please be brief. Yes, my, uh, my question is, um, have, have somebody of you uh, elaborated on the fact that if Internet comes to countries like, uh, I see it in Myanmar, where, where we also have a, pro a project, that Internet means um, Facebook in this context, and how to deal with that? Okay. So... Um, I know of some examples where people have been polled. So people had internet access and people were polled to ask, uh, do you use internet? And they said no. But at the same time when they were asked, do you use Facebook? They said yes. Uh, do you use WhatsApp? They said yes. So there are different ways and means in which people may perceive um, this particular access. And it was not that uh, their access was limited only to WhatsApp or Facebook. The access was full-blown, uh, but these were the things that they were using, so they were more familiar with the, whether they were using WhatsApp or uh, Facebook vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the other services or the internet as such, as a name or a concept they did not have. Yeah, ma'am, you had something to Hello, I'm Gonella Astbrink from Women with Disabilities Australia. Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, some examples of uh, inclusion for people with disabilities and they were excellent examples. We had two workshops yesterday 
about disability and accessibility. And uh, we talked about universal design. We also talked about the future when it comes to Internet of Things and the benefits that uh, people with disability can derive from that. And really, the affordability comes into that. In, in now, there's assistive technologies uh, for smart homes for people who have to have those type of applications to live independently. But with the mainstreaming of Internet of Things in smart homes, as long as you have interoperability, that's going to make a huge difference in bringing the prices down for people with disability. I just want to also make a comment about community networks. And obviously, infrastructure is vital, but also that people's perspective, the need capacity building, to ensure that everyone in that community can gain benefit and that certainly includes people with disability and we've done some work with Pacific Island countries in that regard. So there is a lot of potential to bring on the one billion people with disability globally uh, to ensure that we have good inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, hi, I'm Noah and I'm an ISOC uh, Youth at IGF fellow. My question is regarding affordability. How to get rid of the ISP's monopoly and encourage the ISP's privatization? And how then to get ensure that the competition between ISPs are in the favor of the users in terms of getting affordable access and uh, with the best quality? So let me just address uh, these things to two things very quickly. Number one, in terms of affordability, uh, you mentioned about accessible devices, etc., and services. Um, there are, of course, uh, standards, for example, WCAG 2.0 and others. And if people adopt those, they are not only useful for the so-called disabled people. Look at it this way. If you are using a small screen, and if you have an option of increasing the font size, it helps everybody. Uh, if you can, are using a, any screen and if you have an option of reversing the contrast and if you are outside in the sunshine, it helps everybody. So there are things about universal design principles that if everybody uses, it's for greater benefit to everyone. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, monopoly of ISP. So in most countries, uh, I would say uh, there's a competition there, but in many countries the competition may not be that robust. Uh, in India, for example, uh, the internet services started traditionally with the one incumbent government company way back in 1995. In 98, the day the government announced the policy, I will actually file a petition against that in less than 24 hours after that. But then we got a much better policy. And within a year, we had a few hundred ISPs. Of course, many of them don't exist today because their business model was not very good. But uh, there's a huge number of uh, ISPs in the country even today. And I would say that's also been the experience elsewhere. But ultimately, when it comes to multiplicity of ISPs, this is something where the policy and uh, makers and the regulators have a major role, that they need to look at internet, uh, that even if it is only an incumbent offering these things, uh, not only you have less choice of service providers, you also have less choice in terms of service plans, for that matter. Uh, because they may have only, let's say, one or two plans and take it or leave it. Whereas the moment you introduce competition, there's uh, going to be focus on efficiency, there's going to be focus on uh, uh, def uh, developing different plans. Jane, what's been the experience there? The experience, um, it, the question about the monopolies and bringing in some competition, it's just a fact that there are still some de facto duopolies, triopolies, maybe <laughs> some monopolies in some countries. There's also a legacy um, mentality in both the regulatory and policy um, thinking in some places. It can change and it has in many places, countries. Um, one thing I would say is that people are unconnected and if they're unconnected, certain business models and regulatory models are just not working and funding models. So I'd say we, we need to start thinking about changing that policy regulatory model to, for a more inclusive, um, bottom-up, community-based, where people can come in and actually talk to the regulator, have their voices heard, participate in those hearings and the information coming in. Because if you're running a community network in a small, um, isolated area, your costs on the ground are so much more, the equipment getting in and bringing it in. We have a project in Tushetti, Georgia, um, it's a high, high mountain range, about 4,000 meters to 6,000 meters. 
the horses that were bringing in the towers fell off, one of the horses fell off the mountain bringing in the equipment. Now the horse survived, we're happy about this. You know. But the equipment, of course, fell off the mountain. It's a time factor too. If there's a license to deploy a network and it's a you know, six month license to get the network deployed, that's crazy, right? We're looking at different models that have to be accommodated for both geography, um, affordability, as Adrian was saying before, and the funding models. Universal service, with all due respect to some regulators and policymakers, is broken in most countries. The funds sit in these bank accounts for years, and no one can get them out, and or it takes a year to, to extract the, the money to fund the projects. So let's talk to the banks, look at microfinance, new ways to finance these projects with a longer return, and ways that the regulator, I think Adrian mentioned this or Christopher earlier, it's not just the Ministry of uh, Communications and the regulator. You've got to start talking to the education ministry that may Health. have a vested interest, or the Ministry Health. of e Economics. Health, yeah. maybe. Absolutely. Health, absolutely. Yeah. Health, edu <laughs> education, um, transportation, whatever it is where you can yeah. co combine political interests. Because if there's a political interest as well, that's what happened in Mexico. The regulator said, we're not providing service in a socially marginalized area. We have social purpose licenses, which are experimental. So it's working. The spectrum, there's no interference. Yeah. The project's been deployed. It can be scaled. Why not? I mean, we've got to take a chance right now because we've been doing this for 20 years. And we keep talking about why people aren't connected. It's pretty logical. Sure. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, please. Have there been any examples? Oh, I'm Shannon I'm from Hong Kong. I wanted to ask if there's been any examples of communities that have actually expressed opposition against technological penetration due to its inherent conflicts with maybe the local cultural or religious beliefs? And how have your projects taken into account the ethical considerations among stakeholder individuals that might not be in support of this innovation in spite of your obviously virtuous intentions? So, do you have any such examples where, uh, after a deployment, the local communities actually protested against uh, this, let's say, the imposition of internet access uh, in that particular area? The examples of that sort? Uh, yeah, actually, there is one example. Uh, we have a case study based in Costa Rica. It was an e-government project. Uh, it was very interesting for the government actually when they uh, so what they was provide what they were providing was. Um, the digital healthcare system across the country. And um, what they found out was that uh, in Costa Rica, people were uh, going to hospitals, you know, waiting in lines to see the doctor and to make an appointment. And actually one of the, uh, a couple of cases, they uh, sued the government for changing the system uh, where like you make the appointment online. Because for them, so these were like uh, older adults for them, it was a social gathering, meeting point, at waiting in the line uh, when they go to a hospital to make an appointment because that's where they were meeting and talking to each other, especially older people. And actually, they, res uh, they really didn't like that change. They really um, found it difficult you know, to make this uh, online, I mean, to use the online system. And instead, you know, they, they said they would prefer just waiting in the line, going there, like showing up at 8 a.m. in the morning and meeting with other people who are in their age and discussing about their health conditions and just meeting in general. Because when they were provided that system, uh, so you basically go to hospital when it's your time to see the doctor and you don't make that uh, contact Social. with other, you know, people that maybe you used to. So this was very interesting. So. Um, again, like this was more of a top-down approach and they thought, you know, that will be accepted and really found useful for the entire community, but they had that kind of resistance from the certain uh, groups of, you know, uh, communities in the society, which was very interesting. Yeah. In some places, uh, especially in patriarchy-oriented uh, cultures, there have been resistance, especially for girls getting uh, even a phone, forget about a smartphone, or using internet because it is being seen as a tool of empowerment. So everybody realizes that yes, it is a tool for empowerment for them. But then uh, at times when they see people stepping out, uh, doing other things, it uh, disturbs the traditional power structures. 
uh, it challenges them. And that's again a reaction from some of these uh, scenarios. Yeah, Jane. Just to quickly add, um, we've seen the same thing in some places, but also this may surprise you, but in the United States and Canada and some tribal communities, First Nations in Canada, Native American in the United States, the elders in the villages and the towns have not really wanted the technology to come in, largely due to that the land is sacred to those communities, but there are a lot of youth who want to see connectivity for social dynamic purposes and economic purposes. So there's a new shift where children and the youth are talking to the elderly and some of the elders are realizing, okay, we won't put this on this piece of sacred land, but we'll come up with a solution. And so it's good for education and other. So we're seeing it in different, different yeah. vectors, if you could say that. So let's move on to the last segment of our session this uh, time, which is about assurance. So when we're talking about assurance, it's about things like security, it's about privacy, it's about uh, uh, safety, re reliability of the system and everything else. I mean, this year itself, if you recall, uh, we had a situation when uh, Equifax happened, we had a situation when uh, um, Yahoo acknowledged that they had a uh, huge number of breaches and of course uh, there was ransomware like WannaCry and Petyain during the year. Uh, at the same time, this was also the year when we had a uh, whole lot of other challenges in terms of privacy. The, we have fake news, many other things, uh, these new, I mean to me, uh, being a slightly old hand at the IGF, one of the things to me, one of the major new theme this year is the fake news uh, overall. If, if I look at just the word cloud of differentiations, uh, that's one thing which uh, stands out separately for me. So what's been the type of situation in terms of um, when it comes to assurance, so security, privacy, reliability, those type of things. So what's been the experience from the field research? If you could uh, briefly mention that and then we'll go around. Uh, let's say, what are the, are people having any concerns around cybersecurity? Are people having any concerns around privacy? Are people having any concerns around reliability of the basic internet infrastructure itself? Are people having uh, trust in using these services? Uh, what's been the field experience? So I think uh, inclusion, there are different steps in inclusion ladder when we kind of think about it um, overall. Hmm. And so when you, look at the unconnected communities. So these are up on the ladder. So the first things, you know, what they do with the internet or what they consider is right or wrong, you know, it doesn't come right away when you connect them. And most of the projects that we have, um, we have in our project are the new communities on, you know, unconnected communities who just are introduced to the internet. So I think, um, <coughs> When you think about digital inclusion, you know, there are different steps, so you can't just focus on, you should focus on one thing at a time. So privacy, I think, comes a little later for these communities, but you should, uh, as a <coughs> pro internet provider, I think you need to, um, you know, consider all these at different <coughs> levels at, um, at time. Yeah. Yeah, Adrian? Well, I think this is a really central question. This is when, when Karen asked us at the start of the <coughs> session to, to find a word for the internet in 10 years' time, and I said broken, <coughs> question mark. Um, uh, it was this I had in mind, um, more so than the, uh, even than the affordability challenge, because uh, you know, as we heard before, even if you have the, technical, the technological framework in place and you make access affordable, it is not yet clear that people will uh, make use, make the most use um, of that of that um, of that facility. So I guess here there are there are three components to the challenge. It seems to me, you know, one is is content, and we talked a little bit about uh, how content, uh, in a number of ways, is <coughs> less um, less appropriate, less usable. Um, to citizens than, uh, than we would all want it to be, whether that's in a kind of a local or specific context because of uh, content not being the right language, uh, uh, those kind of issues, or much more at a macro level, um, all of the challenges that we see at the moment and in the last year or two of misinformation and hate speech and, and harassment. Um, you know, there was a great 
panel here yesterday that I, <coughs> I, uh, I sat in on, on digital civility. And I think there's a, there's a great concept there that needs a lot more uh, mining and exploration and understanding um, that might provide a great framework for, what, for how we reg regard content and uh, conduct uh, online to be to be better organized. Um, secondly, there's, there's a challenge, of course, of, of, of censorship um, and the ways in which large, par large parts of the internet are at different times for different people um, out of reach. Um, I think Freedom House uh, found that internet freedom has de declined for the sixth consecutive year. Two thirds of all internet users now live in countries where criticism uh, of government, military, ruling family uh, is subject, subject to, to censorship and governments around the world shut down the internet more than 50 times in 2016 alone, according to Access Now. So many challenges around government action, which I guess in a way is becoming more nuanced and more sophisticated, uh, you know, shutting down for specific periods of time around an election or uh, for specific communities or, or different language speakers, uh, and that becomes all the more important that we tackle it. And then the third one is around around our personal data. Um, and if, our, uh, if we don't understand, let alone control, how uh, private companies are, are using, dealing with, and monetizing our, our personal data, um, then we have a problem. And, uh, and I think the data shows that most internet users don't feel uh, fully aware of the types of, of personal information that is being collected about them. And most people, most of us don't understand how companies are using it. Um, so there's, there's much work to be done there. And I guess, you know, the bottom line is that the personal data of each of us should be considered as much our personal pro pro property as, as, our, as, as the, you know, the, the hair on our head. Um, and if that is the case, if that is the, 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 the understanding, um, then there has to be a way that we can overcome this challenge where our digital selves are currently split, split across uh, different places, different companies that have collected different pieces on us over different uh, times. If each and every one of those pieces were actually ours and were within some kind of uh, um, uh, repository that we could access, that we could control, and we could decide how, uh, how we would allow access on a, on a, uh, on a controlled basis, um, then we would be in a much better place. But I think just finally, I'm sorry to go on a little bit, but uh, just finally, you know, these, these three pieces add up to a real threat to the web and the internet as, as a public good. And, and you know, we argue for the internet as a basic human right, um, such as water is a basic human right, but of course it's, it's clean water uh, that is a basic human right. Dirty water is no good to anybody. In fact, it can really hurt you. And perhaps similarly, there is an internet that is fully understood as a public good that needs to be brought up to that true standard in order for us to really expect to, to, to uh, get access to it for everybody and make that access really useful. Okay. So in fact, uh, today is uh, 20th and uh, we are just five months and five days away from the 25th of May 2018 when the EU GDPR uh, kicks in in that sense. Uh, so you talk about data protection in that. Right? So Jane, what's been the experience in terms of, uh, are people having these uh, things in terms of uh, uh, people should uh, think about security and privacy by design at that level of uh, when designing a particular project or should it come as an afterthought uh, and that's a really good question. about it later? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's usually an afterthought in some areas. With internet exchange points in the technical community, usually it's a thought, but they're just trying to get started. But the key thing is, um, one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about security is not to over-regulate in the name of security, because what we see people trying to do is regulators potentially and, and policymakers look at an internet exchange point as a monitoring facility. Yeah. They're not built for that. It's technical infrastructure, it's a switching platform. Traffic goes over the platform, it's not meant to spy. After Snowden, this is a question that comes up everywhere we go and we often have to just answer it right away. If that's the decision of the government, fine, but don't try and impose certain technological um, difficulties on top of that architecture to make it harder. Same thing with border crossings. We're hearing a lot of remonopolization conversations in the name of security. So to the point that the young woman made about more liberalized um, infrastructure, more infrastructure, cheaper, usually. <laughs> cheaper, faster, better, hopefully. But if you start to re-monopolize traffic going over borders, that's a problem in the name of security. So I think the key thing is no single point of failure, whether it's technical or human. And what that means is training, capacity development, and more. Um, 
and that's it. I think I, I think I'll just stop there. But I think it's the single points of failure you don't want to encourage. And watching this new trend of saying that in the name of uh, um, security, we're going to help have only one company carry that traffic. It's tricky. Okay. Yeah. So Samar, what's been the experience in uh, your uh, side project in uh, Tunisia? Our people are concerned about online privacy and security, reliability, res resilience of the system, these things? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Deepak. That's a good question. In fact, uh, the weird thing uh, with our case is that they are really trusting the internet and they are enjoying it when they get the access. They're not really caring that much about their privacy and it's not good, uh, especially for the kids. So that's why even though we want to create a new community oriented mindset where social connection uh, and exchange atmosphere across generations are key values, but we, uh, we are organizing workshops for the parents to make them aware about the security of uh, the cybersecurity and by uh, making parents uh, aware of uh, about how to prevent themselves from getting hacked, for example, and how to protect their personal data and control uh, their kids, um, the internet access of their kids. I'm always talking about my experience through Tawassal, but in general, I show that people uh, really have to be aware about how to protect your personal data because it's really dangerous. dangerous. I think the challenge nowadays is that uh, usually it is the uh, adults who go to the children about uh, when they have a challenge in terms of internet access, whether it is a device or a service. So children know better how to control the parents' uh, access to internet rather than the other way. Uh, so at this point of time, I would like to invite any other questions or comments from participants here. Anybody has any questions or comments? Uh, yeah. So um, on, on Monday, uh, Vint Cerf said um, he, his greatest fear is that the internet will be um, diverted in different parts. Um, so is there, is there one idea of how to deal with a fr fragmented internet or is it even possible in, in 10 years to give people the internet or do we have to figure out which part of the internet will we give to the people? I think this is what Adrian had mentioned right in the beginning, broken with the question mark, uh, and uh, Jane also just mentioned in terms of fragmenta potential fragmentation of internet. If everybody wants to localize everything, so local context is fine, local language is fine, local relevance is fine, and local community involvement in building infrastructure and services is also fine. Uh, but at the same time, we try to do the physical localization of the internet infrastructure in terms of the data storage and uh, data flow, etc., then the fact is that it will start breaking. And the moment it starts breaking, it is no more uh, the internet. It will become perhaps a multitude of different networks uh, working in different places, uh, at times even without any interoperability across them. And it is not about the technical interoperability. It's about basically about the interoperability of the uh, data itself being able to go from one place to another place. So Jane, uh, would you like to react to this? Yeah, and actually I was in that session as well, and yeah. it was a great session on um, various aspects. The technical architecture wasn't designed uh, from a networking perspective yeah. to go country to country. <laughs> it goes network to network, and the protocols are not political. And I think the key thing that many people would say in IEEE and I, in the Internet Engineering Task Force the Internet Architecture Board, don't politicize the protocols and the, and the standards and the uh, architecture. However, governments are political, so they're looking at solutions. So we really have to strongly encourage at the technical community perspective the, the integrity of the technical architecture and how that works versus politicizing standards to change the way architecture yeah. is. But the balkanization or the fragmentation is a real potential. We have a futures report that came out um, this summer, uh, in uh, well September, sorry, and there, this was one of the key things that we found is that there is this serious. And Karen Rose, who's a, a former colleague from the Internet Society, is here, and she worked on that report for years, <laughs> I think a year at least. But we surveyed over 3,000 people at that time, I think uh, more, maybe 10,000. But it, lots of data came in, and this was a huge concern for people. 
So the question is, are we going to find little pieces of IP-based infrastructure, or are we going to have something else? I hope that people don't politicize the technical architecture more. Yeah. yeah. I think at the same time, we should also appreciate that uh, we all need to work with, with the government. We need to understand the perspective of the policymakers also and provide uh, suitable solutions, which may not be only technical. Part of that could be uh, policy. Part of that could be technical uh, in terms of addressing their uh, real needs rather than just the perceived uh, uh, potential challenges that they uh, at time think about. So it is. I just wanted to add one, one thought on this, maybe around the creation of content, because it seems to me that, uh, I mean, the, the World Wide Web Foundation that I lead was founded by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who created the, the web um, and built the web, as, as people know, a, as a sort of a flat structure on top of the existing flat structure of the internet. Um, and, you know, he, he has always said that the, 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 the reason for, the first reason for trying to create that permissionless space was so that enterprise and creativity could thrive, and that was the only way it would thrive. And so maybe another part of the answer to this question about how do we ensure that the internet uh, is, is maintained as that open, public, permissionless space um, is to really look for ways to drive content creation. You know, the web was meant to be a network of, of creators and collaborators, not just consumers. Um, and, uh, and, and indeed it has been, um, and arguably still is to some extent, but, but not in the way uh, it was a few years ago, perhaps. Um, and, and that's why things like, uh, to take a, a topical and perhaps controversial point, net neutrality uh, are so important um, because maintaining that permissionless space is the way in which the next Twitter or uh, the next great idea will, will surface. And hopefully, uh, you know, that not just the stuff that works globally and becomes the sort of the, 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 the mega apps that... Uh, that uh, many, many of us use, um, uh, but are sort of generic for everybody, but also the kind of applications and the kind of uh, uses of the website that are uh, just as impactful and useful, but for particular communities. You know, uh, I sat a few weeks ago with a group of 200 young women and, and girls who were coding in Abidjan in, in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, and the, the creativity and the energy and the, di the dynamic kind of determination in that room was tangible. And I have no doubt that those women and many others like them and men too around the world will create the, the reasons for the internet to continue to have value as long as we don't put obstacles in their way, including some of the kind of things that are on the agenda in some capitals at the moment. In fact, uh, when Vincent was with us on Sunday at our day, day zero event, uh, two of the things that he did mention was these. One was that on one hand, yes, we, continue, we need to continue to do this permissionless uh, uh, innovation, but at the same time also have very strong deterrence to do away with the harm. Because yes, there are some people who are doing certain level of harm and there may be others. So what is the high level of deterrence which is demonstrable and enforceable, and that's something we should do. The second thing is, of course, uh, in terms of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, people are not just consumers, and which is absolutely right, because internet is a, as a ecosystem uh, enables us to become prosumers, as Alvin Toffler had mentioned in his book, Future Shock, in the early 70s. Uh, so th that's the concept that we are looking at right now again, uh, that people are not only consuming content, people are also producing content, uh, including original content, uh, whether it's a picture, whether it's a video, whether you're writing something, you're even you're sending a message or something like that. So uh, is there any other uh, comment or question? Otherwise, uh, I'll hand it over to Karen uh, for the wrap-up. Uh, yeah, Ishraq, yeah, please. Uh, actually, uh, I wanted just to like to give a comment concerning the, the, the kids that we, we, we are giving them workshops. Some of them, they are actually aware about the privacy and some security stuff. Um, we once had a workshop and we were like asking them to, to connect because we are going to use an online tool and they need to connect through Facebook or Google account. So like some of them asked us to just look there. We are they're going to write their passwords. And then before even uh, um, like uh, getting out from the room, they were like insistent on the connecting from from their account. So we just yeah, we just knew that they are actually aware about the privacy and, and security stuff. So we we are now focusing on this and we wanted like to to to, to focus on um, the, the privacy um, and, and, the, uh, and the security on the internet on the parents as well, because we want them to feel secure when their kids are using tablets and they are connecting 
uh, on the internet. So, uh, actually, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Karen. Well, I think that was a really great dialogue, and uh, I thank all the panelists. So, in conclusion, we wanted to take a few minutes just to, to reflect quickly on the panel and ask uh, first to our participants, we'll go to the audience first, if you have one takeaway from the session today, what is it? Just, and, yeah, just speak up. Thank you. Um, my name is Tatum Figwe from Internet Society, Houghton Chapter. Uh, mine is more of a comment um, in regard to the topics that have been discussed today. So, um, firstly, when we're talking about uh, inter uh, digital inclusion for communities, for me, I'd say um, access, obviously, is the first thing that comes into mind. But also there's the issue of local language, as one of the speakers has also spoken about. Because when we look uh, globally in terms of the use of the language on the internet, we find that the two most languages, they represent close to 40 to 45 percent of internet users. So um, in developing regions like Africa, the global south, um, you find that access is the most important. And then the issues of security and safety, then they follow after. And then furthermore, um, I think in order to actually enable this digital inclusivity, um, a focus needs to actually like take place, especially in regard to young people and men um, and women. Uh, because when you look at the education system, you find that teachers are pretty uncomfortable learning about the internet uh, along with learners. Um, but when you go to a household environment, um, you are able to actually find a, a young child teaching their parents in terms of how to use the internet. So I think it is more of a strategic way of ensuring that there is ultimately that digital inclusion and transformation in communities. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone have a key takeaway? Please. Uh, digital inclusion is not only about getting connected and having an email address or a, a social media accounts. It's about how to shape your life using internet and to be empowered. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share? Key takeaway? So we'll go to the, we'll ask our panelists, Jane. It's the, the content issue, actually. It was coming into my mind that, you know, as Adrian was saying, if people don't see themselves in what they're using and see them, their own culture, they're not going to use uh, the internet as much and create. I think it's the creative. I can't uh, take credit for this, but it was Karen again. I think it's you go from being a user to a consumer to a creator. And that was a mantra that was embedded when I first started the Internet Society, and it still, still matters. <laughs> Uh, yes, I share uh, the same point of view as Jane, and I think that we we should start using the internet with the appropriate the appropriate way because it's not only about uh, doing some researches and getting connected to social media and that's it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, I agree with what my fellow panelists has already already said. And I also I, I think one other take out. I was just listening to what you were saying about um, about the example of uh, people in a particular community who, uh, who who have sort of rejected or, or at least initially rejected um, some of the connectivity on offer because it took away an opportunity and a, and a habit that people had of social interaction of you know standing in line to make an appointment. Um, and it, when you were saying that, actually, I was realizing these, this is not a, this is not a sort of a, a, a challenge of, of one place, it's a challenge of everywhere. You know, my own uh, uh, GP doctor's surgery in rural Oxfordshire in England, um, I went in there a few weeks ago, and now, of course, everybody just taps a little thing on the screen and sits down instead of going up to the desk and saying, morning, I'm coming in for the 8 o'clock, it's Dr. So, so you know, uh, so, so I guess the take out from that is that, uh, you know, number one, there are societal challenges from this that we should recognize as such, and, and, and as we all, I know we all do, recognize that not all of this is going to be fixed by technical or technological approaches alone by any means, and also that these are challenges that affect us all wherever we are in the world. They're not a problem of a particular part of the world. They're, they're for us all. Yeah, so related to that, um, my takeaway would be the inclusive, including the communities into the uh, innovative 
uh, models just at the beginning and asking them, you know, um, what would what their needs are. Uh, so over 100 project case studies that we have conducted, actually, 70% uh, of the projects are either failed or are not sustainable. And um, the reason for that is, you know, those, some of them are because not uh, bottom-up projects. So when it's more like top-down, they come from uh, the innovators or donors or, you know, international organizations. They have certain intentions, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily address the, the real needs of the communities. So um, one of which actually comes specifically in the health sector, uh, which is very complicated and complex. And um, healthcare providers don't see the need, for instance, uh, for them, it's a burden, you know, when you introduce a technology in a hospital and to health healthcare providers, when you say, okay, this is what you need to do right now for all this work that you have been doing in the past. So it's really important to make them a part of this, you know, innovative project at the beginning and explain them how um, introducing technology might help them at the beginning so that, you know, those are, you will not kind of face those kind of challenges along the way. Well, thank you. I think we're at our time and there's probably another session coming right behind mm -hmm. us. So I want to thank our panelists and more so thank our audience and our participants and folks online. Great discussion. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. No, I have a pen. Yes. My bag is over there. So did they give me my card? I yes, you did. Yeah, yeah. So let's see notes later. I'll share. Uh, it's the Chuck 800 project that we wrote.